Right. Happy summer, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jay Michaels, and here we are in the Passion Pit. Now, doors are opening. I'm hearing you can actually go into Starbucks and get a coffee at certain hours of the day. Uh, thank you, President Biden, for, for the work you're doing in terms of putting our nation back. Uh, I won't say to the way it was, because something tells me it's going to be better. Um, but we still have Zoom projects and we still have new works and a lot of things are brewing and a lot of things are brewing where it always has been. Oh, that's funny. I just, uh, Starbucks and a lot of things are brewing. <laughs> anyway, uh, we are talking to, to Anthony Laura and his team at Face to Face Films. Now, uh, if you've tuned into Channel I, where In the Passion Pit is uh, and pressed subscribe, then you know all about face-to-face -face films and how it has gone from uh, their, their Theater Interrupted, uh, which was a small program basically just to read plays into this huge endeavor that now is up to a repertory of at least three projects per month. Uh, it does new plays as well as classics, and it is entering into agreement with Smith Scripts of the United Kingdom to actually present some of the works within their catalog. And in most cases, they're going to be premieres. Speaking of new people, we have a lot of new people with us, but first we're going to talk to, uh, to, to the professionals, the old professionals. Uh, let's start with, with the captain himself. Anthony, Laura, how are you? Good, Jack. How are you? Not bad. Congratulations. You're, you're in your, your new home. You just moved yeah. to, uh, to, to your spacious studio and office and all of that. So, so when, when, you're, when you're not in your main convention center, you're here in the media room talking to us. Uh, you have another amazing month coming up. Tell us about what's happening in June. Yeah, this Saturday we have um, premiere of Christopher Durang's Sister Mary Ignatius. And then next week, uh, Saturday, we have a reading of an older film that I had made uh, called Corinne. And and then the first four episode sneak peek of Alexandra's web series, Haley. That's great. That is really great. Um, let, let's immediately hit Alexandra uh, on a lot of levels. Her web series. Now we hear that all the time from, from uh, theater professionals. Oh, I'm doing a web series. Oh, I have this online. I have this online. Alexandra, how old are you? I'm 12. Thank you. We have a 12 year old that has appeared in how many works now with Face to Face? Uh huh. I don't know. I'm trying to think. The expression uh... I've lost count comes to my <laughs> mind. Uh, it really is amazing. And now you have your own web series. You are, you are out of the starting gate like gangbusters. Tell us about Haley. Tell us about you. What's going on? Um. Well, nothing much, much, but with Haley so far, we've been rehearsing basically, I would say every day. And um, I've learned like a lot and I've got a lot of character development about like Haley and I learned a lot more about my character and like how I should play her and like show her how she feels and like, yeah. It's, it's funny you're saying character development and you're rehearsing and all the, uh, again. I remember the first time you were you were in one of the productions here and you were like, it's good, it's fun, they're nice. And now suddenly we're talking character development, we're talking plot, we're talking building, uh, building the story arc. What's it been like for you through all of this? Now, not only are you stepping into the theater, but you're stepping into the theater by creating roles. How's it been? How has that been for you? What kind of journey did you have? What kind of learning experience? Um, well, I feel like I've learned a lot and I felt like I've grown a lot, like learning more about acting and like learning more about like how to play like a character, like characters and stuff. And I like this role because I feel like it's kind of like a complicated character to like do. So um, when I try to um, like put like, like when I, so I get to start like learning character development and I feel like that's always fun because I like taking on a challenge. So um, that was fun. And I felt like, yeah, I've grown a lot and learned a lot about Haley 
like a lot more about Haley and learned how to play her. Uh, now, now we're talking about your your performances, but now uh, has the bug bitten you further? We always hear the joke, but what I really want to do is direct. Are you looking to write your own piece? Are you looking to direct? Are you looking to go further other than just obviously enhancing roles as you become uh, age appropriate for certain roles? How about anything beyond that? Uh, in, with all these original works around you, do you feel like writing a play? Do you feel like uh, directing, producing? I do like writing, but I've never really been interested in like writing a play or anything. I do like writing some like stories. My favorite to like thing to write is like realistic fiction. Um, I'm more into like acting into it, but like if I had to be like a part of like filming anything or like helping with a the theater, I feel like I would rather be like a part of like costume because I like fashion and I like being creative and like making my own designs. So I feel like I would like enjoy making costumes and yeah. Acting, film, designing. When, when I was in high school, I ended up directing a scene in my drama class and purely by accident. And at that point, I just went, oh, this is fun uh, and, and, and never stopped. And it's obvious you have the same thing, but you're taking it, you're taking it to the moon so much earlier. And I give you so much credit. What's the hardest thing in creating a character? Uh, now you're coming at it from a brand new point of view. What, what's the hardest thing when you say, okay, I got to create this character. What's the hardest thing? Um, well, when I created a character, like, the hardest thing I would say is, like, trying to find, like, sometimes, like, those, like, kind of, like, hidden emotions. Like, when you're, like, speaking, like, there's a lot of stuff, like, in your mind that, like, you don't actually say out loud, but you have to show, like, through what you're saying, but, like, through, like, your facial expressions or, like, your eyes, I heard a lot, and by the way you say it. So I feel like that's kind of hard because like trying, there's like so much other things that are like going on through your head and you have to show them all through one of the lines because it's not like being said. So I feel like that's sometimes hard because like you don't know like what to, like what to, how to like show it sometimes. But I felt like I've improved a lot on it and I've learned how to put like emotions into the lines and yeah. Um, I, I think it's really brilliant that, that you're going for something like that because that is, that's, it, it, that, it never gets easy. That never gets easy. You can have a line, what time is it? But there's 22 different meanings in it depending on the play. So, mm -hmm. so the fact that that is your biggest challenge, you're, you're really on the right track. And I applaud you, Anthony. Uh, you took a major risk. You could have said, okay, let me find a really young looking 18 year old to play, to play some of these roles. But you, you went and you saw the talent within Alexandra and, and listening to her speak, you did an amazing job with her. Uh, uh, Alexandra, I know you have to go. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with you just basically saying congratulations, good luck. Looking forward to hearing more about Haley and so many more other things. And something tells me you'll be sitting, you'll be sitting there being interviewed by, by many people within your life. I, I look forward to seeing, well, you know, after my first Oscar, so, so I give you a lot of credit. Thank you very much. Thank you too. Bye. See ya. All righty. Now, now we go to the next grand dame. Uh, we go to Vivian. Vivian Cardone. I remember the, one of the first projects you're playing. Uh, uh, you're playing a, a mature character. I was thinking, blink, blink. Wow, that's 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 not your age. And you tackled that brilliantly. And whatever role you approach with professionalism and, and absolute energy and brilliance. Uh, uh, what are you doing? What's going on this, this month with you? So um, this month I am in Anthony's original uh, Corinne. I play Samantha, um, the sister of the main character, Corinne. And, and what's, what's, what's the, the storyline? Anthony, if you want to tell us, what's, uh, what's the storyline of Corinne? Uh, Corinne is um, a story about a young woman played by Jacqueline who has uh, bipolar disorder and uh, escapes to um, kind of an old house that they used to have where uh, a young girl named Jane comes, played by Callie, and invites her to be part of a suicide pact. 
Okay. So this is not a comedy. Uh, uh, it's a rehearsal though. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I'm gonna ask you all this because you're all involved in, in the original works. Um, number one, the gravity of the situation. Vivian, how do you approach, uh, now we, we've all done dramas, okay. But mental illness and, and young people committing suicide, it's, it's unfortunately, it's, it's far too topical these days. And it's a very powerful and very touchy subject. We're also in a world now where, where we, we need to be careful on how we say things and how we do things. So, so Vivian, how did you approach this role? How did you approach this play? It's funny because I think this is the first um, time I've I've kind of been on like the opposite side of of mental illness, where um, Samantha herself isn't the one suffering, but she's trying to help, you know, her sister through what she's going through, but doesn't really have the knowledge and the the you know experience. Um, to to properly help her the way that she needs to. Um, and so uh, from my personal experience and, and, and from the experience of people around me, um, I think that was like the most challenging part is like, how do I go about, you know, trying to help someone with a mental illness when I don't know what that's like? Um, and that was actually more challenging than playing someone with a mental illness. Um, that, has, that has been a huge challenge for me, but um, you know, I think for me, it's, I think these are, these are topics that are just so crucial and they need to be talked about and we need to remove any kind of like stigma that comes with mental illness. And I think we, we need to uh, find a way to kind of normalize talking about it and 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 addressing it so that we can develop more effective means of um, combating this this very you know uh, relevant and way too common uh, issue that many people uh, suffer from. You are so right. Um, ironically, playing someone mentally ill, aside from researching. Uh, uh, particular effects of certain kinds of illnesses, there's a level of creativity uh, that you have in terms of playing someone of a mental illness, because obviously that is within their head. Now, if you're playing someone helpless, trying to help someone, it's a different kind of creativity. How do you play helpless? How do you play someone who, who can't help them? Um, what did you have I, to no, do to do that? It really comes down to, and anytime I, I I take on any role, I try to find my own personal experiences and where my emotions were closely or as close as possible matched to um, what that might feel like. Um, so, uh, and that's that's how I can kind of merge myself with that character to kind of bring about that authenticity and so for me like that kind of helpless kind of comes with its own anxiety uh, anger uh, fear a um, little bit of guilt there that you're failing the people that that are depending on you um, it's a very complex kind of, of helplessness and it requires a lot of introspection and and um reflection and I think really just kind of drawing from okay when was the time where I felt this way um so that's that's rather interesting you, you've tapped into the emotions of it when we're helpless uh, a cacophony of emotions goes through us yeah you know, damn it why can't I do something is it my place to do something right. what can I do what can I learn uh that's great that's great you, you you're obviously bringing great depth to that role uh, in a really deep piece. Now, now, Anthony, correct me if I'm wrong. Your your company, uh, uh, part of its mission is to help those with mental illness. Am I correct? Correct. You have an initiative, from what I'm told. Yes, we have um, something called the Julia Initiative, where members of the company speak about um, different aspects of mental illness to try to um, eliminate stigma and provide resources. Excellent, excellent. And you provide this to the audience as well as your artists, yes? Oh uh, yeah, we we put it on social media as well. Yeah. That's, it's it's really great. It's like it's like anyone who comes into the face-to-face -face family as a as a spectator or as a as as an actor uh, can be part of, of what you all do, which is which is 
which is really marvelous. And in some cases, very rare. Um, thank you, Vivian. Thank you so much for that. Um, Gabe, Gabe, there you are. The, the, one, of, one, one, of, one, of, one of the royal faces of face-to-face uh, -face films. Uh, what are you doing? What, are you, what, uh, what show are you in? What are you doing? Yeah, I'm actually uh, double dipping this month. <laughs> Yeah, I got my my uh, my toes in both pools. Uh, in Perrin, I am playing, um, just to put it plainly, uh, a love interest named Corbin. And for Haley Jones, I am playing her therapist, Dr. Kyle Pratt. Therapist? What's Haley about? I didn't ask that of Alexandra. I knew she had to go. What's uh, what's uh, Haley about? Well. Um, if I may, Anthony, uh, it, it is sort of uh, expanding on the world of the girl with the red hair, which is another Anthony Laura original. Um, and it takes uh, the main character, Haley Jones, and it's kind of like a prequel. It's um, a series of shorts to show you sort of how she got to where she ended up um, and how, you know, this sort of started showing its signs of her of her mental illness and how that sort of developed in her early years. Um, so I kind of shed a little bit of light on that as a therapist and you might've seen actually, um, a little fast forward in time. If you saw faces in December, we actually pulled a scene, uh, between the therapist Kyle and Haley Jones, um, which takes place after what we're shooting now. Um, uh, so this is more spoilery. <laughs> so it's actually one of the reasons that we're, uh, also creating the series is because, it's kind of similar to what you mentioned before, Jay, which is a lot of young actors between the age of 13 and 18 are replaced by actors who are 18. Um, so by creating this series around Alexandra, because the uh, character of Haley in the play is 27, um, she doesn't get to age out of this and we can follow her actually growing up over the next several years. Uh, will, will this be, dare I say, will this be a series of works like like Haley at this age, Haley at this age, Haley, all, all the way we'll culminating with her in the series as she grows up? Yeah. Wow. So, so you're basically creating this whole series that leads up to to thus far your magnum opus. Uh, I met you when you were when you were uh, workshopping the girl with the red hair. Wow. Um, I've I've always thought that the film and the the that film and, and theater need to combine in some way, like 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 the the film and TV unions have combined. I think I think the theater needs to join them because we're those lines are blurred, and you're doing a brilliant job of blurring them right now. And I mean that complimentarily. Uh, Gabe, what are you doing in Corinne? Yeah, so I play this uh, bartender named Corbin, and uh, he has some interactions with the main character. Um, but it, it almost seems in a world removed, you know, I'm, I'm sort of on the outside looking in. Um, I'm not privy to anything that's going on internally in her head. So it's just, you know, I guess how it, you know, I feel like I sort of represent metaphorically like um, a, a passage to, you know, that like classic normal life that you you know that we're all accustomed to seeing on the tv you know um but things don't really go as planned all the time so they never that's, do that's all i can say for that um okay so the the, the big question i uh, one of the lessons i've always heard in acting classes and whatever is is one of the one of the the, the key tools of an actor is to know how to forget they don't have they don't they can't remember that the door is going to ring they can't remember that in the next scene some tragedy happens it has to be fresh uh you don't know do, do you know that your character has mental illness that your 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 love interest has mental illness no i do not no what did you have to do to uh to be in a scene and basically play oblivious just like yeah. a, wow, everyone has these 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 wild obstacles. Vivian has to be helpless, and you have to be oblivious. <laughs> um, how, what did you do to that you can walk into the scene and like, oh, I didn't know what was going on. What did you mm -hmm. have to do as an actor? Yeah, you're right. That is that is actually one of the hardest things um, for an actor because especially you know you run these scenes like a million times that um, it, it's hard not to fall into like that those predictable motions. Um, so a really keen skill is being able to just um, 
I think the, the key word is focus, right? Is not focus on that, right? You're, you're, you have to be very present in the words as they're coming up. Um, and it's a kind of like just quieting the mind, you know, you have to sort of, um, keep the, that register like in the, in the background. Um, and, and the more you can focus on like what's actually in front of you, the easier it is to keep out all the other noise of like, this is what's coming or, you know, you got to stay as present and grounded in the present moment as, as possible. And that's, you know, I'm working on that constantly. So it's no, always striving for it, you know? That's, uh, it's very astute. I, it, I, I, I come to mind whenever I see a rehearsal of a musical number, uh, uh, you always see that, you always see the dancer so much like, you know, because someone's about to come into their arms, someone's about to dance in front of them and they know it's coming. The trust of just one, two, three must be incredible. And, and it's the same with you. It's like, I'm, simp I'm simply talking to you. You ask me what time it is. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what I'm going to answer. So you really do have to push so much behind you. Yeah. Um, do you find, uh, and, and I mentioned this a bit with Alexandra, do you find the need to, to foreshadow? Do you find certain moments where you say, should I, should I hit this word harder so that they remember what's happening with this character, even though I'm not supposed to know about it? What's, is there a balancing act between furthering the plot and making sure I'm oblivious? to it, is there, is there that moment where you go, okay, maybe if I said that a different way, then the point gets across, but I don't look like I know what's going on. How do yeah, you balance that, such a thing? That is, um, I would say that's part of the craft of the role, right? Like um, acting as like a craft is more than just like living presently. You know, there is a little bit of like fixing that goes on because you are inevitably, you know, the, the main purpose is to tell a story, right? You want to, make sure that, you know, the plot is clear and that like you're hitting your, your targets um, so that the audience, you know, completely understands what's going on. Uh, so, I mean, that's more of the director's role, obviously, is like, you know, I want you to, to hit that a little harder. Um, but as an actor, it's important to know holistically, like what you're tackling and, and how you want to approach things. You know, you can phrase your monologue so that like, it's cut cut in a certain way um but that stuff is done sort of before and then when it's the performance it all gets thrown to the back and hopefully having done it enough it kind of lives in you so you automatically kind of like flow into those motions while still keeping it organic it's really just you know like one of these you know all the time <laughs> so the best actors can do it with like 10 hands and different objects so you know we're all working to get there you mold everything, here it all is, and now I'm throwing it away, and then you get out on stage. There it is. Wow, it is, it's like jumping out of an airplane. I hope that parachute opens. Um, Jacqueline, uh, actually, Jacqueline, are you playing, you're playing uh, Corinne? I didn't yes. hear you, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, you say it with terror. That's, that's good. Okay, you're playing someone mentally ill. You're playing someone mentally ill in a new play. So you can't very well research how it's been worked. Um, what was your procedure? What was your obstacle in creating this role? Well, I usually avoid doing research like that to begin with, because I don't want another actor's perspective to inform mine. Um, but I did a lot of research in terms of what bipolar disorder, how it manifests in a person in a day-to-day -day life. Um, I myself deal with mental health issues. I have since I was very young, but mine are different. And so they manifest within me and present different challenges in my day-to-day. -day. And so for me, actually, the biggest challenge has been finding how Corinne deals with those things on a day-to-day -day and how it affects her and deters her because I know what mine does to me and I didn't expect it to be that big of a challenge because I deal with mental health issues but it's it's another world and it's been hard for sure but it's been a lot of fun and for me the main thing with any character but specifically someone who is dealing with something so intense is just empathy and refraining from judgment of any kind 
because somebody someone who's struggling with that kind of thing can can act out can lash out can do things outside of their character and so trying to distinct what is my character as Corinne and what is my mental health seeping through and challenging this relationship like with my sister or with Corbin or with Callie you know what moments are really me and do I as Corinne know what is me and what is my mental health because having that sense of awareness is really tough as a person in general knowing how you know sometimes you get in a fight with someone and you don't even know how it started and then you look back and you're like that didn't need to start how did I get here it was something else it was my anxiety it was what happened earlier today so it's been a challenge but it's been just a lot of asking questions from every single moment now, now you say you have your own challenge in terms of, of mental illness mm -hmm. um and yet you said this is harder we always hear people make these these comments oh i know what you mean i da, da, da. um which sometimes can be so insulting uh why was it harder? Why do you think it was harder? Even though you understand mental illness probably more than, than many, why do you think it was harder? Um, I think it's the specific mental illness, bipolar disorder. Um, there's not a, enough research on it, for one. Um, there's barely even good enough treatment or understanding or prevention. Um, so that's one thing and i'm not i'm not sure why it's been such a challenge it might be an emotional blockage um of maybe tapping into something like that is too real and scary i i come into a lot of that in my work i end up getting a lot of very emotionally demanding roles and I love to go there. It's a lot of fun to go there, but I can't go there every single rehearsal. Otherwise I wouldn't know who I am at the end of the day. So sometimes I have an awareness of what is asked of me and where I need to go. And I understand it, I can conceptualize it, but that won't show up until the day that I perform. Cause that's the only day that I really need it. And so sometimes I almost like tap around it as I'm doing the work, if that makes sense. Did you have any, yes, it does make sense, a lot of sense. Did, did you have any aha moments, if you will? Did you have any moments where, where concerning your own issues, your own life, as you're creating this character, you just went, oh, I should think about that for me because of, of, of my own life. And any moments where, where, where your, your own personal journey seemed to, to, uh, to be enhanced? Yeah, yeah, a lot. Um pretty much every single day and every single moment. <laughs> yeah. And that I find that with every work. I think I learn a lot about myself as a human being every time I tap into a new project. Because for me, it's about connecting to humanity and the truth of that and the challenges that we face as humans with one another. So a lot of questions come up for me a lot of I mean I try my very best to find myself in my character and not make as little distinction as possible um and you know stop when I leave the rehearsal because otherwise it can be damaging but yeah it makes me ask a lot of questions about myself and learn a lot about myself too and grow I feel like with every project that I do I am better as a person you are epitomizing uh, uh, a, the, uh, an onerous stereotype that needs to be destroyed. Uh, everyone thinks how easy it is to act. Everyone says, oh, how much fun. Oh, you learned all those lines. You know, that's like how many times have any of us heard that? Wow, how'd you learn all those lines? Or, or you, you say, I have a character. And they said, yeah, but what do you really do? Uh, and, and the difficulty in playing an actor and being so vulnerable so often, the difficulty in difficulty in doing this it's really incredible and and you're 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 exemplifying that beautifully uh i wish you luck i have a feeling it's going to be a virtuoso performance and i know i'll i'll be seeing much more of you uh here at face-to-face -face films amongst other other places um 
We have another newbie, Madison Gray. Welcome. How are you? What are you doing? What's new? Hi, um, I'm well, thank you. So I am playing Maggie Kane in Corinne. Um, and Maggie is kind of like a long lost friend to Corinne, uh, but very far separated. And it's, it's very interesting to play a detached character, but also very involved at the same time. Um, yeah, it's just, it's Corinne in general is just a very complex storyline with very important characters um, and how they all intertwine with each other, um, but still are very different, I think is like the most fascinating part about this particular piece. I'm gonna grab a word you said. Uh, when, we, when we talk about people we haven't seen in years, we say, oh, I lost touch, mm -hmm. or, um, or I haven't seen him in years, or it's great to see him again, whatever it is. But you're saying in terms of, of this, you are detached. Um, what does it mean to be detached? from One character being detached from another, what did you have to do to get that point across. I have a feeling that was a very important word to you. What did you have to do for that? Um, I think for myself personally is trying to find, again, like what everybody has mentioned you know, before, is how can I incorporate myself into Maggie? I don't wanna put a caricature out of a character named Maggie. To me as an actor, it makes much more sense to personalize it and how would I, Madison, in those given imaginary circumstances, respond to said character situation. It's all situational at the end of the day. Um, when I say detached, everybody lives in their own bubble of comfort, of familiarity, of distance, of pleasure, of all of these things. Um, and particularly Maggie and Corinne's relationship, it is detached because I don't want to give too much away. I don't want to spoil anything, but there is a moment where there's a reach out for just a sense of normalcy. Um, but given the circumstances is Maggie is very much in her own world. She is not involved with a lot of what's happening with Corinne until a certain point. Um, and so there's that sense of like, we were friends, but something at one point in life changed. Um, and so having that sense of reality of not seeing somebody for however many years and then being kind of sat down with random chaos, I guess is the right way to say it, is a very interesting thing to try to do um, because again, you don't wanna to know too much. I know what happens with Maggie and Corinne. The whole cast knows, right? But it's my job as the actors to take it moment by moment and really make it into a real, a, a proper reality. I need to know, okay, I need to know not to know too much, I guess is the best way to explain that. So, so, <laughs> so okay. again, like Gabe had said, learning it, forming it, getting it, and then right over the shoulder, I don't know too much. That way, when you are seriously connected in the situation and you put yourself in those circumstances as the actor, you start to believe the conflict. You start to believe the relationships. And once you're there, there's really no stepping out of that. It's the beautiful thing of acting, I think. Of being attached. Yeah, totally. Very good. Very good. Uh, you know, it's funny. When I, when I first said it, I thought, well, aren't I splitting hairs with that question? No, you, you, you elucidated me brilliantly on that. Thank you. Um, Alexandra Salter, you're, you're another one emerging through the curtains onto the face-to-face -face stage. What are you doing? Yes. What are you playing? I am playing Elise Bell in Haley, and she is a girl um, who seems very popular, has a lot of friends, seems really happy on the surface, but there's there's something underneath that hasn't that has yet to be revealed, and and she has an interaction with Haley, and and they kind of they. They, they're kind of feeling each other out. And it's really exciting because, because this is an original work and there's more to come that there's a lot of possibilities on what that relationship could turn into. Oh, that's really interesting. That's right. This is a web series. Um, mm -hmm. my, my old brain that remembers TV series got to throw web series <laughs> in there. And it's the same right, basic right. thing. Okay, so there's a future here. Do you know the future? Are other episodes written already or, or, or is it? No, I don't, I don't know yet, but that's kind of, 
that's kind of the exciting part that like that how everyone is saying you're you want to live moment to moment with your character and and when you know the whole script and the whole story sometimes that you know you have to work really hard to just be able to throw it over your shoulder and just be in the moment be in the present and forget about it but for me I'm kind of I'm kind of growing with Elise and with Haley in that relationship and just being surprised by new things as they come. There's there's two kinds of, of theater. There's real, well, there's many kinds, but in this case, there's realistic and naturalistic. Mm -hmm. Realistic, there's a beginning, a middle, and end. You're, you come right. into a piece, you understand where you're coming from, who you are, and there's an ending, a naturalistic piece. You exit the door and, and something else happens and we don't know the curtain falls at that point. Mm. Uh, a web or TV series, it's the same thing. What do you do? Do you have to like put in, as you're creating the character, do you like, like stock up, if you will, on thoughts? Okay, what if my character does this? What if I'm now part of this? I have to think if I get this, if they get, do you, do you, do you create, you know, we all sit there and say, okay, well, when I'm this age, when I'm this age, do you create a future mm. for your character so that whatever you step into for this, you're, you're on the road? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, I mean, whenever I work on a character, I, I always make sure I know my general circumstances. I, I want to know exactly what's happened in my life in the past, what's going on in the present. And then also something that I like to do is just, I mean, as we do as humans, like you said, we, we plan out like, okay, next week I'm going to be doing this. Or when I grow up, I want to be this. And so I, I like to do that with my characters as well, because they're, they're just real people and everybody has that plan. And, and, you know, you go through life and sometimes things get thrown at you and, and you veer off the track that you thought you were going to be on and new things happen. And yeah, so that's, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot with this role. Wow. That's great. Really is great. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that. There's so many times in interviews, someone says, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'll get the script next week. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're ready to go. And that's, that's really wonderful. Callie, Hi. Callie, you're another one that's brand new here. Oh my goodness. It's like, like all these new faces, yes. all these new faces of face to face. Uh, what are you in? What are you doing? How's it going? I'm well, thank you. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm playing um, Jane Breedlove in Corinne. And Jane is who Corinne meets once she gets to that old family cabin um, and ends up making a suicide pact with her. So there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> yeah, you, you, say, you, you have a lovely voice. And so, just, oh yeah, and then we made a suicide pact together. Um, right. The thing about Jane is that she's, <laughs> Anthony has so brilliantly written her to be a naturally uppity person that is so contrast with what we would think someone who suffers from suicidal ideation would be and would go through. So it's been really interesting to play that dichotomy and to see how that influences other characters and how that gets Jacqueline's character, Corinne, inevitably to maybe come with me on this journey. That's a really interesting thing that your character is uppity. What do you mean by uppity? She's always positive. She uh, always has a smile on her face. She goes around to the community and gives out books to people. And uh, she actually practices something called smile therapy, where she just sits in the front of the mirror for 15 minutes and smiles to herself really big. Um, there's this really interesting fascination with happiness and bright colors and a bright personality and perhaps maybe to cover up all these things that she's feeling underneath. Anthony, you're good. That's, that's a great twist right there. Uh, Kelly, how do you play a happy-go-lucky person who's plotting their own death and the death of somebody else. Holy, how do you do that? Yeah, so um, suicidal ideation, fortunately, isn't something that I've ever had to experience. Um, so there was a, a removal 
kind of a sense of like, okay, how am I going to get into this character? How am I going to do this? Um, what I've found with every work that I'm in is that there's always a way in, whether that's through the text or through the circumstances or just by what someone wants in that moment. Um, you know, it's this, the symptoms of being an empath, like uh, Jacqueline was saying, um, where you can just relate to people and you're non-judgmental. Uh, so finding my way in of just a pure want to not be alone is really what connected me to this character. And, and you know, it's, it's the thing of where we're, we may be feeling so much inside, but we don't want other people to know, or we don't want to be a burden, or, you know, it's, it's, we don't feel like that we're that important for them to, like, need to worry about us. Um, and so that was, that was a really easy way to connect Jane needing to have such an uppity, positive vibe in order to just say, no, I'm good. Don't worry about me. Did you have to, and this is a real tender question, um, did you have to almost rationalize suicide? Did you almost have to accept the notion uh, to play this role? You yourself, because we all, you know, we, we, we've all played roles somewhere where we said, wow, I, I, I would never, whatever. Uh, did you have to accept suicide and, and rationalize it essentially uh, to, to make this an effective role? Um, I try to stay away from getting too real like that because I don't want to affect my own mental health. Um, but as I said before, there's a way in. And so what she wants, why she has the suicidal ideation, that's what I could connect to. And that's just on a fundamental humanistic basis of our want to not be alone and our want to have companionship and for someone to understand us. So that, that's how I connected to it. So, so it wasn't so a matter of rationalizing it, it was a matter of, of, of understanding the human nature and where it could go wrong, yeah. if you will. Exactly. Very clever, very clever, thank you. Anna, Anna Solis, uh, what show, what part, what are you doing? Yes, I am, sorry, there's a little bit of construction going on, but- uh... It's okay, there's a plane flying overhead in my place also, so don't worry about it. <laughs> I assume, but yeah, um, I play Juliet in uh, Haley, so yeah. <laughs> and and tell us about Juliet. Tell us about your relationship in that show. So Juliet, she comes towards the end of the pilot. Um, she is introduced as a homeless woman, and she shortly uh, shares that she has bipolar disorder. So I haven't. Uh, been able to see the girl with the red hair, but I've been told, I understand that this character is kind of a short foreshadowing of what Haley will become in, in her years to come. And yeah, I mean, it's a way to introduce this, this mental condition to her and, and how that plays off. I, I'm really curious because we only get the pilot for now. So it's really, it's really exciting um, to see what how, how it'll end up. So uh, a mentally ill homeless woman. Yeah. There you go. That's, <laughs> that's, that's not the sound of music. Wait a moment. Uh, what, what did you, uh, did you seek out people to, to see tendencies? Did you, did you research? How do you, it's one thing, okay, to play a homeless person. That's one major hurdle because we, we could be very stereotypical and, 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 and to be homeless, it's, um, I've, I've had individuals that have lived in shelters that were, were functioning all the way around, you wouldn't know it. So homelessness is, is a, a wide spectrum. And then to play someone who's mentally ill, who's homeless, wow, what did you have to do to build that character? So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm still um, uh, like kind of discovering and kind of like playing around with her. Um, I, we, we talked, Anthony and I, that, that she has just become homeless. So she's not like one of the, I don't want to like, like stereotypical, like she hasn't been on the streets for so long. So it's more about the fear of ending up like that. Um, 
because she has been left all alone. I think that that's more what, what I'm tackling with. She's left all alone and to her own devices. She's very aware that she has this condition um, and she has no, no way to treat it. And I think that's a scary thing. I think she's like coming to terms to like really just be out there on, on her own like really being face to face with her inner demons and, and, and her mental condition and all that stuff. So it's, we meet her at a very low point, definitely. It's, it's really interesting because as much as, as you're the parable of what Haley might become, you're also the parable of this nation over the last 15 months. We all essentially became homeless in the sense we couldn't leave our homes uh, and, and I don't know how many of you, I, I, I went through the head trip of, of what defines me is what I'm doing outside, who I'm talking to, where I'm going and whatever. So to suddenly wear sweatpants for all of 2020 uh, was, was uh, it, it was shocking to me. Uh, so you're, you're sort of a parable also for this nation because we ourselves had to look at ourselves, the fear of, of what's happening. And I think it's really interesting that you're, you're newly homeless so we we don't we don't see the the destruction if you will we see the 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 slow decline we see the the beginning of the decline wow that's going to be very interesting to watch that's going to be really very interesting to watch um anthony uh, uh before before i now speak to nikai am i pronouncing it right nikai yes okay Thank you for being late mr j michaels that is that is completely all right this is zoom if you didn't say anything people would think the little box was just there and they just didn't notice um anthony two questions for you your characters have such depth in terms of this uh these are not simple parables these are not stock characters there's such depth and such layers um where does it come from in you what did you have to do to build these kinds of characters? In terms, uh, so I don't really outline um, or do character sketches. I start with um, one, one character basically, which is why most of the shows have a, a leading protagonist. Um, and then I just try to think about stuff um, that interests me first of, what has happened in my own life and then stuff that I have never experienced. Um, I've had, you know, I personally have never been homeless, um, but one of my favorite films is Agnes Varda's Vagabond, um, which I think was one of the only films to get that right. And I don't think many people um, have watched it. Um, and same thing, I still have not really seen a movie yet. Um, Girl Interrupted is a different example, but that has um, gone to do mental illness, right? Um, because it usually has to be changed. A woman under the influence is the only one, in my opinion. Hmm. Um, so it comes from wanting to see things uh, not held back. Um, and that's kind of where I start creating from. Very cool. And then you're astute enough to pick actors that are going to, to dive headfirst into them. Really quick question that I'm going to talk to Nikai. Uh, where do you get your names? Where do you get the names for the characters? That's hard. That's what I spend the most time on, actually. Um, I, if I'm writing very, very specifically for an actor, um, I really want to make sure that the name fits them. And that's that's a longer process. Um, mm -hmm. If I'm not writing specifically for an actor, um, sometimes I like to pick names that um, are kind of the opposite of what you think they would be. Um, okay. So, but writing a lot also, I found that I come back across the same names. Um, so trying to find new names is also very interesting. It, it, your characters are uh, they, they all have interesting names they all have a, an interesting sound to them uh, mm -hmm. this is not the first anthony laura group of plays that we discussed that you wrote and yet they all have very interesting names i was wondering if there's a math to it so so that's really cool that's really cool what you do with these keep doing that because because 
you can't see necessarily, but sometimes I'm sitting here and someone will say something and I'll be nodding and in my head I'm going, that's a great name. Oh, so well done. Um, Nikai, you're, you're in the only non-Anthony written production. You're yeah. in Sister Mary Ignatius, a, a, a lighthearted comedy that takes place in, uh, uh, with nuns. So it must be very light and frothy and simple. I mean, yeah, the name. Who are you, who are you playing? What are you doing? Aloysius. I had to Google that. And that's the name of the character. Um, it's basically, uh, I mean, it's, th there's a blurry line, I think. I, this is the first time I read this play by Christopher Durang. Um, it's like a very dark comedy. So it's like, you know, um, you kind of get both worlds of like, uh, very dark and real pack of emotions through the whole thing but at the same time you got to keep it you know a little bit on the surface because it's a comedy uh, Aloysius is um, one of several characters who go to confront this nun that taught them through Catholic school and it was very dreadful for them naturally and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and and they just confront her about the stuff that they suffered and it's it's very funny it is but it's like complicated not complicated but it's a little um it's tricky it's a little tricky to to um obtain that comedy you know but i've has, has it gotten more here genre. sorry uh what were you going to say that I've been learning to, I guess it's the first time I, I have to like uh, play around with this kind of genre. Yeah. Uh, is it, did it get trickier where uh, when we talk about church scandals, it's now, uh, it's now something that's in our lexicon. We just sort of know it. You say church scandal, no, everyone knows exactly what you're talking about. So even though this play does not focus that way, if you will, we're still talking about a, a spiritual figure that was abusive to to her flock do you think that did you have to approach it with any difference and i'll i'll throw it out also to anthony on this did you have to approach this play uh, with the difference knowing okay now that people look at the church differently and 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 other such things i have to consider Nikai, did you have to did you at any point take into consideration the the notion of 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 abuses within the church for this show I don't understand your question. Can you? Uh, they're church sex scandals. We hear all this time about church priests. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And so now you're saying a group of students, a group of, of, of young people are confronting yeah. this nun. Now, yes. while that's not the situation, it is still the notion of confronting this nun on what she has done. Mm -hmm. uh, did you, did, did any of, of what goes on in the world hearken back here in creating your character? Oh. Uh, I think I would respond that like um, Kali did. I think I, I, I try to find um, different doors rather than what actually happened to enter that character, at least for me. I just try to see what turns me on um, regarding whatever that character is feeling. And uh, uh, I think that's my answer, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah. That's a, that's a, a way tough, tough question. One. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think we had to find a new way in really that was necessary because a lot of what um, Nikai's character, Nicole's character specifically, um, who has really been, who has orchestrated the event for them to come and confront her, um, it actually helped um, with what has been out in the zeitgeist. Because I think when this play was written in the 80s, uh, that stuff was not well known. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think more people um, have opinions, whether they're in favor of the Catholic Church or not in favor of the Catholic Church, their opinions are more passionate now. Um, there's no mm -hmm. middle ground, I feel. Um, and even people I know who, um, 
who favor the Catholic religion are not the way that he favored it in the 80s. Um, there is more like, yeah, but I really don't like that they still do this. Um, so I think in a weird way, a very weird way, and the play is very weird that way, it makes it funnier. Um, because you're also looking at these things and you're saying, okay, well, they, look at what they did then. Like there's a lot about the talk of, you know, it's the equivalent of murdering someone as eating meat on Fridays. That's in her monologue. Um, so I don't know that we think so much about eating meat on Fridays with religion as much as thou shall not kill anymore. Um, but the extremes of it are still there. And that's, it's really interesting when, when the play opened in the eighties, I remembered it was quite shocking. Uh, and any play that dealt with the clergy in the 80s and before that, it was always shocking because like, ah, they're opening up this dark door that we know nothing of. But today you're right. An audience is going, oh yeah, oh, oh what did she do? Tell me about it. And they're walking into it, you're right, much more informed. So yeah, you probably will have much more of an engagement in terms of your audience. In terms of the audience, Anthony, tell us when these shows are going to be. Uh, I, know you, I know you're on multiple platforms. When can we see them? What days can we see them? The whole works. Sister Mary is tomorrow at 2 p.m. on Broadway On Demand. Corinne is next Saturday at 2 p.m. Uh, on YouTube and Facebook. And, Cur and uh, Haley is the next day, which I think is the 27th, um, at 4 p.m. At, on Facebook and YouTube. Now, when you say Facebook, where are they going? What's the Facebook? Face-to-face -face films face-to-face -face films. Mm -hmm. and, and is it the same for YouTube? If someone wanted to go to YouTube to find you, it's face-to-face -face films there too? Exactly, yes. And Broadway On Demand the same? Broadway On Demand has a link, but the link is in our Instagram. So, but you Excellent. can also just search Sister Mary. I think it's so cool. My God, but I, I remember when there were like seven channels. You know, you're not on channel two, you're on channel four, that's it. Now it's like, okay, here we go. You're, it's on your phone, it's on your watch. It's, it, I think it's amazing. Um, and I think you're all amazing as well. Good luck to all of you. Uh, lovely chatting with you as usual. I'm sure I'll see you, many of you next month and I'm sure I'll see you all as, as the months go on. Uh, give them hell. Uh, make sure that audience understands what you're doing. Make sure they learn because you have wonderful lessons to teach them. And, and, and here's, to a, here's to some great performances and on to the, next, to the next set of repertory shows from Face to Face Films. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. Ciao, ciao.